Mm -hmm. I guess I didn't see him. <laughs> uh, you already got yours, right? No, don't worry about me. It's okay. That's all right. That's all right. All right, we are, we are going to begin our second panel. Obviously, we've had some attrition here with, uh, with lunch, um, but we do want to welcome you to uh, the last uh, panel that we have this afternoon, which is an outlook for the wider regional market, the Middle East, Africa, and, and uh, Asia. Uh, my job's pretty simple on this one. I'm going to introduce John Lucci, who will be the moderator for this panel. He will get you acquainted with his fellow panelists, and then we'll begin uh, this afternoon's discussion. Uh, John Lucci is a partner at Oliver Wyman and a member of the global automotive practice portion of the firm's manufacturing, transportation, and energy division. Mr. Lucci has substantial experience with strategy, manufacturing, transformation, and reorganization in the transportation sector. Over more than two decades, he has guided corporate wide lean transformation projects, strategy development for greenfield plants in the U.S. and abroad, and due diligence for private equity firms. Recently, his work at Oliver Wyman included strategy development for automotive OEMs and tier one suppliers in Saudi Arabia. Please welcome to the podium, John Lucci. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. And I'm um, very happy to be here today. And uh, given that we're, we're after lunch here, we're probably gonna get some people wandering in. We'll try to keep it somewhat casual. Um, with the panel discussion and what we're going to try to do is get through sort of the introductions and I have a half dozen slides or so that will will kind of be a recap from um, what you heard this morning so uh, a little bit of a recap and a little bit of new information as well on the broader auto market and the and uh, the market within the region um, then we're going to go right into a Q&A session, and we have some questions that, that um, we'll, I'll kind of lead, and then we'll open it up to the, to the panel as well. But this is more about um, the market in the region and, uh, and where we're going from there. So with me today, just as, a, um, as an introduction to the panel, um, first of all, here on my left, I have uh, Mr. John St uh, Stadwick. And John is the President and Managing Director of GM in the Middle East. Um, Mr. Stadwick has served in the position since March of 2010, and he's worked with GM for almost three decades. Prior to serving as president and managing director, uh, John lived in Shanghai, China, and was vice president of aftermarket, or uh, sorry, after sales for General Motors International Operations since 2009. He also served as GM Asian Pacific vice president of sales and marketing and after sales since June of 2008. So John will be our first panelist. And then sitting next to John is Jack Rodenkel. And um, Jack is managing director of Chrysler Group for the Middle East. Um, has been since January of 2010. Since joining Chrysler in January of 1985, he's held various uh, or a variety of high profile positions within the company, working in the US, Latin America, and Europe before taking on his current role in the Middle East. Next would be Larry Prine, and Larry is the Managing Director for Ford in the Middle East. Since 2010, Mr. Prine has overseen sales, marketing, and parts and service operations for Ford and Lincoln brands in the Middle East. Um, Ford Middle East operations in I Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, the Levant, and the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council countries, the GCC. Previously, Mr. Prine was based in Puerto Rico and ran Ford's Caribbean and Central American 
operations across 24 countries in the region. And then finally, Alan Martin, and Alan on the end is um, Vice President, uh, Global Aftermarket for Power Solutions at JCI. And Mr. Martin joined JCI in 1984 and was recently appointed the Vice President General Manager of Global Aftermarket. In this role, he and his team focus on the strengths of local markets, leadership throughout the region, and have operational responsibility for the balance of the SLI lead acid battery manufacturing facility ar facilities around the world. Um, and they're supporting both aftermarket and original equipment uh, customers with the SLI product. So we have with us today a very distinguished group, um, three of the major OEMs from the uh, Detroit area, and then, and then one of our top tier one suppliers as well, all doing work in the Middle East. So now um, what I'll do is I'm just gonna go through a few slides here talking about the general market overview for the MENA region and then we'll get into the uh, question and answer period, okay? All right, so the first slide here, um, really just showing the global, the worldwide market. And um, in terms of sales on a worldwide, it was about 78 and a half million um, globally. And growth in the, obviously in the Middle East has been significant over that time period. Um, we expect, our view on this would be that the, um, the growth in the Middle East would be somewhere in the 7% uh, range over the next several years through 2018. Um, and uh, we see significant growth, obviously, with uh, over 700,000 units into the Saudi Arabia market just last year, which you've heard already. Um, oops. Let's see what's happening here. Sorry about that. Uh, let's do it this way, it be easier. Okay, so getting into the MENA region itself, um, you can see that um, from, the global, from the global growth down to the MENA region, looking at Saudi Arabia, it's, it's by far the number, one, um, the number one auto sales in the entire region, um, with a close set or a, or a distant second coming in with the UAE. And with over 700,000 new units this year, they actually surpassed um, what the what the experts were forecasting for 2012, um, and there's expected a 23% increase in 2013 again, which will put them somewhere in the range of about 870,000 uh, units as well. So, everything we've heard this morning so far indicates that there's solid growth potential for that area and very solid growth potential for Saudi for Saudi Arabia in particular. You saw this map before as well. Plenty of maps this morning. Um, but again, we just wanted to uh, accentuate the fact that from an export standpoint, Saudi Arabia is very well positioned with the Red Sea and the, the ports going there um, into the European Union and also um, uh, into the northern Africa regions and then of course on the Gulf side being able to go into Asia, Central Asia and um, that area as well. So again, um, very well positioned. Uh, from an from a infrastructure standpoint, from a logistics standpoint, to serve the greater MENA region, as well as internal markets. If you look at the fragmentation of the auto industry in, the, in Saudi Arabia, and this is, is really what kind of drove some of the thinking around the auto zone that you heard about um, earlier today, um, but the fragmentation there is, is quite substantial. Um, Looking at the, the chart on the left side there, the pie chart, the Japanese manufacturers really dominate that market with uh, somewhere in the 70% range um, in total. Um, if you look at the rankings of the top 10 vehicles sold in 2012, of those, five of those models were from Toyota, so they continue with strong sales in the region. Um, three of those markets were from Hyundai, and their Hyundai is coming on very strong in the region as, as well. And then Ford and Isuzu rounded out the, uh, the last two of the top 10 for the region. Um, again, Toyota dominating with over 37% of the total market uh, at this particular time. Hyundai coming on strong, um, as well as the other, other players in, the, in that region. Um, the other thing I guess that's important to note is C-size vehicles are also, are also uh, um, 
predominant as well with a younger generation coming up and a and a growing middle class uh, the C segment vehicles are starting to take on quite considerably finally premium brands last year set records not surprisingly for the region um, between Audi BMW Porsche um, they're all making strong pushes into the region and Bentley and Mercedes-Benz with over 40 percent in growth um, in one year so very strong uh, performance by those players as well. And finally, where is the automotive industrial activity in the MENA region? You heard a lot about this, so I won't spend a lot of time here either um, from this morning. But, uh, but certainly Morocco with seven assembly plants, um, commercial OEMs there are Volvo, Mercedes, Mitsubishi, et cetera. Um, they're, they're very strong and growing. Iran has the largest uh, auto production in the MENA region, and most of that, though, is for local production, for domestic production, very little, um, very little export in that area. And then Egypt with a large number of assembly plants, 29 assembly plants. So there is a lot of opportunity here um, in that region, and obviously Saudi Arabia is what we're focused on today and have uh, are well positioned to take advantage of that as well. And then finally, just another recap of the, the activities that, uh, that we've seen recently in the OEM and supplier production, um, the JLR, uh, Jaguar Land Rover announcement or letter of intent, um, and the commercial vehicle side with Volvo, with, uh, with MAN, and, and with uh, Mercedes-Benz, and then of course GM has um, work that they're doing there as, as well with assembly buses, and we'll hear more from Jack on that. Um, Isuzu, et cetera, and then we'll hear more from Alan on the joint venture that they're doing from a battery technology. Okay, so just that was just my recap on it. From this point forward, we're going to move straight into um, introductions from each of the panelists. And so I'll first invite John um, to talk about uh, General Motors and what's going on there. Oh, thank you very much, John. Uh, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. It's great to be here today. Uh, General Motors has been in the Middle East for 87 years. It was great to see the, uh, the picture of the Buick. It reminds me of my time when I spent in China. Uh, the Buick was also one of the first vehicles introduced into the China market, and I think that's why Buick is so popular in that part of the world. Uh, today I'm responsible for uh, the Middle East, which includes all the GCC countries, Levant area, Iraq, and Afghanistan. So. Uh, I think probably the, the four of us up here are probably pretty lucky in the sense that we're in a region of the world that is growing tremendously, uh, great opportunity, especially over the last few years and what we see going forward into the future. Uh, today we have about 300 employees uh, based in the Middle East. That includes our parts warehouse, uh, about 170 uh, sales, marketing, engineering individuals and the rest for our parts distribution. We go to market with three brands in the Middle East, uh, Chevrolet, Cadillac, and GMC. Uh, we also have our parts brand, AC Delco, and we're a, a partner with uh, JCI and a uh, battery manufacturing plant in Saudi Arabia. And I know Alan will talk a bit about it, but a, probably a great example of where you get the right Saudi partner along with uh, a great partner with JCI and AC Delco and General Motors to really uh, make a, a winning, winning uh, business proposition. Uh, so look forward to uh, discussing the, the industry with everybody, and I'll turn it over to my counterpart, Jack. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, Salam Alaikum. Uh, Chrysler is, uh, we're the, we, uh, of the big three, we've always been number three in similar situation in the Middle East, although rapidly changing, rapidly growing. We represent, uh, I represent between uh, our alliance with Fiat over 10 brands within the Middle East, from uh, the iconic Jeep all the way down to uh, the uh, Fiat Abarth, which is a Cinquecento, the little small, very tiny car. Doesn't appeal as well uh, to uh, a, a, a more of a European audience, but we've been uh, we've been, as John said, very fortunate to be in in a part of the world that is growing with a very young, vibrant. Uh, population um, and a, we've been 
one of the things that I think is uh, we have been very successful in the last few years is we have some great partners in our different markets because I operate, uh, as John, within the GCC, the Levant area, uh, of course, uh, Iraq, uh, Yemen, and Afghanistan and Pakistan. But uh, the success that we've had is uh, because of our partners, we've gotten to know our customers much better and have been able to deliver a, a product and a, a value proposition that's been uh, pretty exciting because while the industry's been growing at a, uh, at, a, at a phenomenal pace, we've been doubling and tripling it on an annual basis because the other thing that was fortunate from my perspective is you're coming from a very small base to begin with. So growth has been, uh, has been very uh, strong, and especially in, in the Saudi region, because Saudi dominates. And it is, uh, for us, uh, we've got, as I, I was saying to the minister this morning, because he was asking, why do we have just one, one partner in Saudi Arabia? And I said, well, originally we had, because uh, we've been operating in the region since 1947 also, we had multiples and we had different families but what we had done is uh, a little different, and it shows that uh, they're always willing to innovate within Saudi Arabia, is we brought the three families together into one company. In fact, uh, the current chairman told me the, the real blessing was, he goes, not the uh, as strong partnership that you brought us together on, but you gave me also one of my best friends, because one, one of the other board members in here are best friends for life. So, and, that, and that's part of the way I think we feel about, the, I think all of us would feel about the Middle East is, uh, the people, the culture, it is very welcoming, very engaging, and, uh, and on the fortunate side for uh, when you have to report back to headquarters, it is a, uh, it is a growing, vibrant area. So it's, uh, it is an exciting place and an exciting time to be there. So uh, after that, I will turn over to Larry. Thanks, Jack. Our, for Ford Motor Company, um, our territory is the same as Jack and John with the uh, GCC, Levant, Iraq, Afghanistan. About 60% of our sales come from Saudi Arabia. So it is the key market and a very important market for us. Uh, we, are, we have opened an office in Riyadh and our new country manager, Rock Legault, will be leaving Saturday actually uh, to, to land in Riyadh. So because as we've grown in Saudi Arabia, uh, we believe we need more people on the ground to assist uh, working clo more closely with the dealer. Uh, you saw some of the challenges that the domestic big three have up there with the dominance of the Japanese brands right now. Our philosophy is, you know, customers will buy once from a, a dealer, but it's the service aspect that will bring them back again and again. So our dealer uh, in Saudi Arabia, Al Jazeera Vehicles, has been, we're working with them very closely on expanding facilities, on initiating a training academy, on opening quick lanes and quick parts service uh, and op parts operations, which are much closer to the customer and more convenient to the customer. So between the Ford and Lincoln brands, uh, we're trying to essentially uh, reshape the, the, the footprint we have in Saudi Arabia, as well as throughout the whole Middle East. One of the major challenges we've had over the past couple of years is um, Crown Victoria was a, um, a great vehicle for Saudi Arabia. Let's, let's face it, it may, it may have been unappreciated a bit in the U.S., but in Saudi, it was great. Um, and we've had to transition away from Crown Vic as production stopped here. And that's been one of the major challenges, and we've managed to do that with some of the new products we have coming in, as well as putting more emphasis on some of the other vehicles. Um, so we've made that kind of transition, and now what we're really focused on is capacity, uh, working with the dealer as far as improved processes and people. All right. Good afternoon. It's a privilege to be here to, uh, to r number one, participate in the panel and, and to hear the speakers that I've heard today and, and to put it in perspective from, from a tier one supplier uh, in, in serving the OEs and what we do, it was really interesting today for me to hear more about the, the materials and components and things that are really feeding into what we do. And, and to put that into perspective for you, Johnson Controls, we're about a $42 billion company and half of what we do is in the automotive space. It's in the interiors of, of automobiles. 
So we're the leader in making car seats, uh, dashboards, uh, door panels, the overhead systems that we supply uh, really to the table here as well as other automo uh, OEs around the world. So for me to, to learn that and understand really the, the research and the things that you're doing really to help us in the future is significant. Uh, in our automotive space, we have about 240 plants around the world. Uh, we leverage our technology, uh, you know, pretty consistently with our, uh, our quality systems, and we drive that on a consistent basis. Uh, the business unit that I'm representing is our, our, our power solutions business. I've been with this division uh, close to five years now. I've been with the company for 30. Uh, I was in our building efficiency business before that, and we have a pretty strong presence in, uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, through our York uh, brand and York International there. So it's a pretty strong presence there. Uh, but in our power solutions business, uh, we have close to 50 plants, right around 50 plants around the world, uh, 36, 30, probably 36 to 38 percent market share in the lead acid battery. Uh, we provide uh, most of the batteries uh, uh, to all of the OEs, uh, very high market share there, and in, even in the aftermarket, we do very well uh, in all regions around the world. Probably the one that we're underserved a little bit now is China, uh, but we're making some significant investments there. Speaking of, uh, in Saudi specifically, uh, we have Talal Al-Zamil, our uh, general manager of our uh, Middle East battery company. He's with us today. And, and that's really a partnership that we have uh, in, in Saudi that we've had uh, for several years. Uh, it was really started earlier by uh, GM and the Delphi, and then we acquired that in 2005, along with several other operations around the world. Uh, we mainly manufacture the AC Delco brand. Uh, and have a great partnership there uh, really with GM on that. But in addition, our partnership in Saudi, we have five partners, five business partners, and, and they're not silent partners. And, and when I think about the success and what we've done, they're active business partner, partners. It's a win-win. They're at the table. If we're not doing something, they're pushing us. If they're not doing something, we're pushing them. Uh, but it's a really uh, strong relationships, uh, but it's really it's about win-wins and helping us drive the business forward. We've been growing on an average about 10 to 11 percent a year for the past 10 years. Uh, it's a strong, strong market for us. Uh, 60 to 65 percent of our business is in Saudi, and we ex export about 35 percent of our business uh, from that plant uh, to the rest of the region. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, so at this point, what we'll do is we we did go out and do some canvassing. Um, prior to the to the uh, conference today, and we have a few questions that we're going to direct to the uh, panel team here. Um, we'll try to work through those questions and then open it up to the general audience for uh, continued questions as well. Okay. So the first question we have <clears throat> is, what from your perspective, what do you perceive as the primary advantages of doing business in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? Um, anybody want to volunteer as a starting point on that one? I'll start John? out and I'll yeah. let my counterparts maybe uh, chime in. I think uh, Jack started out strong business partners. Uh, Alan talked about uh, five partners, uh, business partners. For us, we've got two strong dealer partners throughout the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom does represent about 50% of our business. Our relationships go back to 1947. Uh, our largest uh, dealer is in Saudi Arabia. He also happens to be the second largest Cadillac dealer in the world, and that's uh, Sheikh Ibrahim al -Jamay. Uh You don't build a business overnight. 47 years is a long time to, to be partners with somebody. Uh, but the strength, obviously, is a strong partnership, but also the fundamentals of Saudi Arabia itself. Uh, you take a look at the population, 60%, under the age of 30, uh, the fundamentals of the uh, the banking system today. Uh, you, you take a look, uh, public debt is very low from an emerging market standpoint. Uh, external debt is less than 20% of GDP. And then uh, foreign assets, about $665 billion uh, thereabouts. Also, the local banks, a lot of liquidity. Uh, probably uh, some of the strongest banking uh, in, in the uh, industry. 
which if you have a strong economy, a lot of liquidity, people can buy cars. Uh, we've seen the growth over the last few years uh, because money is readily available, so they can buy General Motors, Chryslers, and, and Ford vehicles. So uh, strong partnership, strong economy, demographics that uh, just die. I didn't say Hyundai. We've got a Hyundai dealer here in the front. You guys get your fair share in Saudi. So, but even, though, even a few Hondas are uh, supported and sold. But uh, Jack, anything you want to add into it? I agree. I mean, you know, when you look at it as strong partners, it is a uh, liquid growing market. But I'd also say is, uh, re re relating back to what John Lucci said, over 70% of the market is dominated by the Japanese and the Koreans. And, but when you understand that, well, the one thing about the customer is, uh, it is, uh, and this is stealing something from Dubai, but open hearts, open minds. They are looking and they are open to you and open to your product if you offer a, a, a good value and they'll, they'll give you a chance as, and you just need to deliver on the promise. And that's with between uh, our partners and ourselves, uh, I think the same as my colleagues, it's been, uh, it's very, it's become a very important market for us. For, for Chrysler Group, it's about 45% of our total business. And actually United Motors Company is the largest independent distributor for Chrysler Group in the world. Any other market uh, would be, we would be the distributor. So we, but here, again, we have a partnership that's been forged over decades. So it's, it's a, is a very solid place to do business. Okay. Anyone else like to comment on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll mention some of the same things, the partnering we've talked about, but uh, when I think about the stability, uh, the ease of doing business in, in the region, uh, in spe spe specifically in Saudi, uh, the tax uh, plays and the, the things that we can do there, you know, we feel it's advantageous. Uh, but the other thing, when you just from an economic point of view, it's, it's growing, you know, you can argue three times or so faster than some of our mature markets. So if we're going to participate somewhere, we need to get the growth. Our shareholders are, ex are expecting that growth. And so we, we have to play them. We can't ignore these markets. Uh, the other thing that I, that I would really get at is we mentioned a couple of times earlier today the cost of energy. That is a huge play, uh, I think, for you. Uh, because for us in the battery manufacturing, we consume a lot of energy just in the manufacturing process. And then when we go to charging the batteries and, and really get them ready before we ship them is a huge deal. It's a huge expense for us. You know, we'd put it right behind the cost of lead. Uh, so, so having that and having it centrally located uh, for us is a good, good location in the region. And, and the final thing I'd say is just the heat is good because he <laughs> kills batteries. <laughs> Batteries. Ba batteries last about two years in Saudi, and they last four years everywhere else. So it's a, <laughs> it's a great location. <laughs> well, it's, it, it does the same thing for power sometimes. Um, the, um, everyone's talking about the partners, and you know, there is no reason not to be in Saudi and big in Saudi. The whole Middle East is, is a growing area, as you've seen earlier today. Our partner, Al Jazeera, as his Chrysler counterpart, is the largest single dealership in the world for Ford Motor Company uh, and on several vehicle lines. So it's a, it's a very important market that is getting a lot more attention within the Ford corporate environment. Uh, as far as product decisions are being made, um, where in 2009, for instance, we sold about 20,000 vehicles in Saudi Arabia. Last year was closer to 50. So that growth gets attention from the, com the company. That growth is what drives trying to get some products uh, more appropriate to the market, for instance, or things that the customers really want. So it's becoming a much more important uh, aspect within Ford Motor Company also. If I could just add into that, too. I belong to a group of CEOs in the Middle East, and it's uh, a number of different companies, not just automotive. Every major corporation, multinational, has identified the Middle East as a growth area, especially what's going on in Europe today, they're looking at where can we grow. And you are seeing more resources, yeah. more people being put into the Middle East because they do see the potential. It is one of the few places in the world that has sustainable growth, has the right population mix, has the right support from the governments to continue that growth. They're looking for diver, uh, diver, diversification 
of the industry to get away from just being based on an oil-based economy. And I think that uh, plays into all of our hands there. Okay. Very good. Well, maybe a segue based on Larry's comments with respect to um, having the right vehicles or the right segments placed in the region. We did see a, we do see a lot of growth in the um, in the C and D segment vehicles. Um, would you want to comment on that, uh, or or anyone for that matter, with respect to maybe what you're thinking about for for the future of Saudi Arabia? Is the future of our product strategy? Um, well, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk in generalities. I right, can't get right. too specific. Yeah, um, but essentially, uh, we've uh, you know when Crown Victoria was forward for a long time in Saudi Arabia. Now we've gone to having a broader spectrum of vehicles that are attractive to customers. Uh, the Taurus has done a, has gone a long way to kind of replacing at least a, a good portion of the Crown Victoria sales. So on the D segment, we're doing pretty well. It's the smaller cars that are, um, have been an issue because, frankly, we've taken them out of Europe and other places that have been higher cost. Um, so we are going to be launching the Fusion that's now available in the U.S. later this year, and that we think will do very well in Saudi Arabia. We're also looking at some lower cost manufacturing sites, uh, like in India and other places, to bring some cars that are more competitive with uh, some of the cars you saw on the top ten list there. Um, over the next few years, as, uh, as our footprint in Asia Pacific has, has gets bigger too. So, you know, we have big growth plans in the Middle East, but it takes the right products uh, combined with then having the right facilities, combined with having the right processes to make it all come true. So we're working on all those aspects of the business. Okay. I'd, uh, to add to what Larry said, because I think it, it, it is key, and also to back to the first question, one of the things that makes uh, Saudi and the Middle East a great place to do businesses. It is one of the last bastions of, it's a very fair and open marketplace. The rules are the same for everybody. Uh, you have a maximum of a 5% duty. So you can, if you've got a product that you can, that is attractive, you can compete with it. A blessing and a, uh, also, also uh, a real issue. Because when you get in, where the bigger issues is, is, is Larry alluded to it, when you're looking at the C and the D segment, it's incredibly, and, and this is one of those things that you have to always highlight back to the product community because they look at it and they also think it's the Middle East, they have lots of oil, everybody's rich, <laughs> and so they, they only want big cars and it's like, well, no, they really want, the biggest segment is the, is the, is the compact, midsize is a fast-growing segment, and the pricing is extremely competitive and the product is sourced from around the world. So that's one of those things that we are, I think all of us fight with that battle on a daily basis of finding uh, the product that is competitively uh, priced, that is attractive and meets the region's requirements because yes, while heat works for batteries, it makes, that's why we do a lot of testing and I know I'm sure all my colleagues do a lot of in-market testing because the heat and the uh, humidity conditions are very unique. So if you don't have a product that'll meet their <laughs> needs at a cost, especially within a uh, certain payment, you can't compete. And that's, I think, for the key for all, uh, for the future. And that's where we all fight the Asians. So I, I don't want you to take my comment about my batteries only last than two years to get a warrant. <laughs> I don't want to get a warranty. I'm going to get a warranty call here now. <laughs> all right. I, I, I would say the else. Middle East is a microcosm of the United States for the big three. Mm -hmm. We've lived on sport utilities and trucks, basically for our market share, and we've given away kind of the passenger car segment. Uh, but with the products I think all three manufacturers are bringing the market today, we are starting to claw and get some of that market share back. I know for us last year, we grew our passenger car business from a low base, but up 67%, because we are now starting to bring passenger car vehicles that meet the needs, <coughs> needs and wants, and at a price point, the Saudi consumer will uh, will respond to. So at least our strategy, defend our market share with pickups in sport utilities and start to try to earn market share on the passenger car. And thanks for getting rid of the Crown Vic. That certainly was a big step in helping us. Uh, <laughs> Always good to have friends. What are we going to do to help? Yeah. Great. You know. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I do think I'll add from, from an aftermarket perspective, the, the changes that we see the OEs driving 
it's going to be pretty exciting in the future, but from an aftermarket perspective, it's making it more complex. Uh, they're all coming out with new technologies, new drivetrains, the engines. They're, I mean, they're modifying a lot of things. And so when we look at our business and probably other businesses in the aftermarket, the skew proliferation of supporting the older and then the new that's coming through. And then you think about here the SUVs and the small cars and everything that you have coming in uh, to one country. Uh, the strain, if we don't do it right and, and really think forward from a vision perspective in the from an aftermarket perspective, could be dawning in the future for, for your aftermarket businesses. The inventory that they may have to carry uh, and so forth and the ability to service. So, so a lot of it I think is really headed in the right direction, but it's something that we think about and, and how are we going to manage this in the future. So, so that's another interesting point. And the used car market has been growing as well, and I know there's been some initiatives recently regarding the used car market um, and strategies by some of the big OEMs. Anyone care to comment on that? We see, we see uh, the, the used car business is a, it's, it's not a traditional business that a new car dealer in the Middle East would be involved in. But uh, we also do see it as a critical piece of the business because uh, it's going to determine what the residual value of your uh, product will be. And because uh, financing is such a critical piece of the purchase in Saudi Arabia, we, uh, we need to make sure that our residual values are going to be there strong so that the customer knows in two years and three years that he's got a confidence in the purchase he makes. So what we've done is we've gone out with, uh, uh, with certified pre-owned vehicles where we make sure that they, uh, the consumer gets a vehicle that's been gone through a 125-point check uh, that we make available uh, from the factory an aftermarket warranty for uh, an, an after, but a, a factory warranty for used cars and uh, especially because prior to let's say 2009 there was a you know when the US created a, a large number of late model used cars that then went in throughout the Middle East a lot of that has dried up and, and gone away so it's become more of a traditional used car market and that's why we want to make sure that uh, from our perspective, the cars that are in there and our brands are uh, will be taken care of and serviced and supported. Yeah, we, we view the used car market as it's an opportunity. <clears throat> Again, traditionally, a lot of the used cars have come in from the U.S. Uh, with prices at the auctions here higher and you know the supply not as great. We are seeing more opportunities to try to recycle the cars in Saudi Arabia. But frankly, one of the things <coughs> we're facing is very stiff competition from the sucks. Um, there are a lot of people who want to buy the used cars, which is good. It helps the residuals. But that's an area that we're working with all our dealers on is to try to um, improve the used car operations, again, to <coughs> help the residuals, as well as to try to get to a new client base, the people who may not be quite able to buy a new car but want something that's very close. Okay. Okay. Um, one last question here, and then we'll move to the audience. But... Um, there was some mention about partnering opportunities and stuff, and I guess how would you characterize partnering opportunities in the region? And maybe, um, Alan, you might be a good one to start this this discussion given the, the JV that you're working through now. Yeah, I, I've had the opportunity to, as I mentioned earlier, work in two of our business units, and both uh, had strong, both have strong partnerships and, and relationships with people in Saudi Arabia. And, and I can tell you, Going alone in, in some places and doing it without that, uh, we've seen people, they struggle, they don't grow. Uh, and, and it's what I mentioned earlier about, is, is it really a business partner or a silent partner? And it's not about the money in a lot of cases, but it's really about having a strong business partner. And, and for, us that, <clears throat> for us, that's vital. Uh, there's things that are going on in the country that we may not know. There's connections, relationships. How do you maneuver? Uh, who knows who in the government if you just need some help on funding or something else? Uh, to me, the, the, those things are, are, are critical uh, in, as, as we operate our businesses and really in both of our business groups. So uh, I, don't, I don't think you could do it. Uh, I don't think any other place in the world uh, where we would like to have some of those relationships, and, and we probably need them, you can't find them like you can uh, you can find them in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it's it's to us. I think it's the number one success factor. You have the right partner. Uh, you work with them well, and um, it's not success isn't guaranteed, but it's much more likely. 
um, they, they take care of um, the customer's right, they take care of their people right, and that's really what you're looking for. And you, if you can find that, and we have, luckily, in Saudi Arabia, um, you know, that, that's number one key for success in the Middle East. Yeah. And, and I think you know, the, the MEPCO battery company is a great example, a great model, where you take a great local partner that supplies the local workforce, the local talent. You take JCI that brings the technology into the marketplace, and then a brand like AC Delco. And today, we went from 15 years ago, no sales, to today, we'll do three and a half million batteries throughout uh, the Middle East, North Africa, a little over $200 million, 40% market share. It shows what three strong partners can do. Technology, the local business partner in Saudi, a strong brand. So yeah. I think a great model of success. Okay, great. Um, at this point, we have some time left over here. We can uh, open it up to questions in the audience. Back here. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you for the, the discussion. I was uh, wondering if uh, any of the big three has short-term or long-term plans to establish any assembly operations uh, in the GCC region. You know, manufacturing is a strategic decision. Uh, I, I wouldn't comment in, in this forum on what our manufacturing footprint is going forward, but we look across the globe for the right opportunities to manufacture. And, uh, you know, we, we look out throughout the GCC. Just so you know, today uh, in the uh, uh, MENA region, we do manufacturing in Egypt. We do it in Kenya, we do it in South Africa, uh, but we do look constantly across the globe. But it is a corporate strategic decision and uh, nothing that we'd reveal in front of all you folks that would keep it a secret. <laughs> uh, it, definitely, because the, uh, the only person who announces that is the chairman. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> he's not here right now. And he's, he's exactly, <laughs> so, but it is a, uh, again, we, I, I only can reiterate what John said is we, we look at it on a, on a holistic worldwide basis. In fact, we also look at it now in, in conjunction with our uh, fiat partners. Okay. I've been impressed by the uh, resources and the thought that has gone into the plans uh, that we, we saw today. Um, and again, I think that from a process standpoint, it's been done the right way. But, you know, we can't, we're not going to make any comment on it one way or the other. Okay. But can I? We sound like politicians, I'm, I'm, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the question. No, I'm not, I'm not a no Go lead. ahead, Alan. Uh, you know, but I, w I was thinking through, I mean, the stuff I saw today, I learned a lot. Yeah. I really mm -hmm. learned a lot about what you're trying to do and how you're trying to pull that together. And, and, and my plan is how do I take this material back and, and share it with my organization? Uh, because it needs to open their eyes up that, that there's there's something unique going on here and it's different and, and how do you how do we get more knowledgeable on it because at one one day somebody's gonna say we're gonna get a phone call and they're gonna say we're moving a plant we're doing this or whatever and we have to be ready uh, because we normally follow uh, so there's some education that you know we will need to do and I'll need to do internally to, to prepare our organization for things like this Jack? Jack Fursley, NICDP. I want to ask you about manufacturing. I used to be part of General Motors, worked in several continents, and I understand the constraints. But the question I have, more pragmatic, you keep on talking about the uh, success you had with MEPCO, is one of the flagship uh, companies in uh, aftermarket. What can we do together to replicate the success? Uh, we've done some work on aftermarket. There are a lot of opportunities in the GCC in Saudi. Um, is there a way to create a mechanism to work together to exploit these opportunities? I think, you know, Talal, maybe I'll have you raise your hand there. We've got a great business partner here that does a number of different type of manufacturing, and he's one of our partners uh, with Mevco Battery. I know we have conversations all the time on 
what are the opportunities to expand that business to go beyond just batteries? So I think the first piece is getting with one of the local business partners, one of the local Saudi business partners. If you have uh, technology or product that you believe that could uh, be replicated and brought to the Middle East, I know there's a number of individuals in this room today that are looking for opportunities to continue to expand and grow. Um, yeah, that, that's what I was going to To me, that's the difference. Uh, you know, we go to other countries within the region, we've had sponsors and others, and it's not the same. Uh, you, you get the right business partner in Saudi uh, that, that really want to engage in your strategy and your strategic planning and, and be part of it. That, to me, makes all the difference. Then I think it's the distribution and the quality product and, and all the processes that you can bring. Uh, but to me, it really starts with the business partner. Okay. All right, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Others out there? Back. Okay, hi. Um, the question is the um, barriers that you can see in the Saudi economy that uh, can be improved in Saudi Arabia to, uh, to have a better economic environment. Thank you. In terms of, you know, of course, your business. Barriers from an economic environment? Uh, in, in doing or business, in doing work? Business, uh, what can Saudi Arabia do uh, to improve the economical environment in there for the automotive companies in there? I, I think from an economic standpoint, they're doing a lot of things right. Uh, also from an education standpoint, building universities, improving the education. Uh, I would say the biggest obstacle we've had growing there is actually finding housing to put people in. Uh, the population's growing so fast. Uh, in the government, I think it's spending $40 billion over the next few years to expand housing. Uh, but housing and visas, and you know, normally if you have a good partnership, which we do, visas are not a, an issue to get. But I would say that's probably the been one of the stumbling blocks of just housing, I think, is across the entire kingdom an issue today. Yeah, we, we opened our office probably 18 months ago and have had a country manager, but he's been based in Dubai because we couldn't get the compound housing in Riyadh until very recently. So now it's coming. There are a lot of projects underway. Uh, it looks like, you know, there'll be plenty of, op plenty of uh, space in the next, you know, between now and the next 18 months. There are several compounds opening up in the Riyadh area. So it, it, that was, again, that was, you have to have people in the country to really understand what's happening there and, and work very closely with your partners. And that was the stump, biggest stumbling block for us was just getting them into, uh, you know, getting them, making, making sure their kids were in the right schools and they had the, the compound housing. And it took a while to do it. <clears throat> but again, I think you've heard today from the, uh, the ministers that talked, there is a interest to di diversify the economy there. I think they're looking for everything, you know, you bring an issue to them, they're trying to get it addressed and, and resolve it. They want your investment. And I think that's why you probably see uh, so many multinationals investing. There's over $20 billion, I know, of uh, some counterparts that are investing in Saudi Arabia over the next few years. Everybody's looking to get into the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And I think it's go when I look at it, there's all any market you're going into is going to have uh, obstacles to go along with opportunities. The biggest difference I see is, is what John was alluding to, is economically, they don't, the barriers aren't in place. I, uh, in my previous job, I was in Europe, and when you, were, when you were dealing with different markets and different tax structures and different regulatory environments, it was, uh, it was uh, incredibly difficult to try to find, uh, to match the product to what the customer wanted and still fit within the legal frame and, and, and economic framework. And we don't have that barrier, and I think that's going to be what's one of the main drivers for the future economic growth. Okay. Well, I, I think just on, on that particular one, just a comment from the work that we've done um, in the region, they are doing a lot of the right things, right? Okay. Everything from in infrastructure with the ports, with the new multimodal um, expansion capabilities, from education, energy, 
um, attracting suppliers and supply base. And um, if you have the right suppliers in the region, then you know it's kind of a chicken egg thing that could happen between suppliers or the does the OEM come first and then bring the suppliers with them. Um, and then also with the with the work that's been done on the auto zone and looking at ways to reduce the large capital expenditures that an OEM would have to be able to bring bring attract the uh, the OEs to the region even though they're looking at initially small volumes right so if you can't go in and build a plant that can uh, an assembly plant that can build um, several hundred thousand units a, a year the ROI is pretty tough on that but if you can do things like they're proposing in the in the auto zone where you have shared services and shared capital expense on on the big ticket items like stamping and paint etc then it starts to become much more attractive so um, from from my perspective as well, I think they're doing all the right things to, to really make it a, a, a success. So, okay, another question here. Well, so nobody's mentioned women in the workforce today, and I was wondering. So women can't drive in Saudi Arabia, but uh, so I said nobody's mentioned women in the workforce, but are driving. Nobody, no, women can't drive in Saudi Arabia, but I bet they have something to say about cars. Yes, that do. are bought. Yes, they, they have something to say about everything. everything. Well, that's <laughs> Thank God for that. But no, they have something to say about cars and which car either they, they get driven in or which car their husband drives. So, so the question is, yeah, they drive you crazy. Okay. The, the, <laughs> the, 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 question, the question really is, what do you guys do to get women's input in the products that are needed in Saudi Arabia? Because I'm sure that's important. A absolutely. We all know women yeah make the decision just because they're not driving they're being driven in cars uh, we, we do uh, uh, market studies and we get women's input everything from color of the cars that we launched to uh, what features and benefits especially many of the women are driving in the back seat not the front seat so that's very important of how do you equip uh, the vehicle but uh, it's no different if it's Saudi Arabia or if it's Shanghai China you do market studies to find out what it is that the public wants. And yep. women make up half the, uh, the population and probably more than half the decision-making rights. And f I can say yeah, uh, from that Sorry, standpoint, uh, one of the, I asked that question one time, because in the U.S. we consider about 80% of the buying decisions are influenced strongly by women. And I asked this of a Saudi salesman, and he looked at me and he said, it's higher here. <laughs> <laughs> But one thing we do that's different, a little different is uh, we also have a part of our product development, it's called uh, the voice of the customer. And so we actually bring into the marketplace, uh, train people who can, in language, ask the questions. Uh, in, in Saudi, we only, of course, in the service lane, you can, cause they go into the service lanes and do this, they're out there talking to men, but within the region, we talk to men and women. And you, it, it's, there's some similarities that, that then gets fed back up through, because as Larry said, the region is much more important to all of us, and so the input from it is is looked upon as very important. And it's especially now instead of here's the car, how can we adapt it? It is now part of that process from uh, day one. And as far as Ford goes, we use the standard processes we use on a global basis. We just have to change the tactics a bit sometimes, where we have women-only groups, for instance, if they're evaluating vehicles. Mm -hmm. So, or you know, the on the quantitative side, where it's email surveys, things like that, it's, it's pretty easy. But we, we do bring advanced products in market, test them versus other products. In that case, instead of having mixed groups, we just have you know, men's groups and women's groups. So we try to use the same processes in Saudi or in the Middle East as any place else in the world. Uh, it's just, again, a little, little change in tactics. Okay. One last question. I would, li I would like to thank you for uh, your contribution, your input today. It's been really great. And now, nowadays, whenever we talk about women driving in Saudi, we always follow it by the word yet. So, so <laughs> we'll see, we'll see what. Yeah. But uh, I think uh, uh, it, it will definitely put you at an advantage if you start assembling or part manufacturing things in Saudi Arabia. And, and we'll leave this up to you. you you're, you've been great diplomats uh, in, in your answers. We'll, we'll leave this up to you. But my, my question to you is, uh, have you thought about joining forces in establishing a training institute, for example? Manpower is, is a big issue in Saudi Arabia. Saudization is an issue. So have you thought about joining forces and establishing a training institute specifically for automotive? We, ha we have not 
discussed it. Uh, we are working on a training institute or training academy with our dealer, Al Jazeera. Uh, and that process is, is ongoing right now, but we have not we have not talked with Chrysler or GM about doing something like the Japanese have done in Jeddah. Yeah. Not together, but we yeah. have five training centers throughout the Middle East, two in Saudi Arabia today, yeah. where we bring in both technical and non-technical training for our local Saudi employees. And similar to Larry, we're, what we're looking to do is to set up actually something there to especially go out and, and instead of having to recruit overseas, recruit local talent and develop it. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's been our privilege to uh, be here today and share this information with you. Thank you. Thank you uh, to our panel. Uh, just a couple of closing remarks before we adjourn. Uh, I want to uh, remind everyone that uh, we are just beginning this journey in promoting the automotive industry in Saudi Arabia. I want to let you know that we will be organizing a mission for companies interested in investment and uh, aligning themselves with Saudi companies in the first half of 2014. I also want to announce that we will be having our third U.S. Business Opportunities Forum. As many of you know, we've had successful ones in Atlanta and Chicago. The next one will be in Los Angeles, September 16 through 18. Uh, so we look forward to you participating in what are excellent networking opportunities. Also want to uh, advise and remind uh, you that uh, SABIC is having an open discussion, Salon 4 at 3.30. Uh, as well, uh, we want to uh, also say that there's going to be a press av availability at 3.30 as well. Uh, the Royal Commission, another reminder, Dr. Allah made reference to March, uh, a March uh, event on downstream petrochemicals held under the patronage of King Abdullah, March 4th through 5th. And you can find all of that on our website, uh, which will have those linkages. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, hey John.